Thank you. Uh, so, as he said, my name is Josh Sokol. I'm the Information Security Program Owner at National Instruments. I'm also the chair of the OWASP Global Chapters Committee, and I'm the co-chair of OWASP AppSec USA. So, uh, if you guys have any questions, problems, concerns, whatever, I realize we're getting towards the end of the conference, but feel free to talk to me. Um, and, and especially, you know, any feedback, if there's ways, things that we can do uh, better for you next year or whatever, let us know. Uh, we're here to, to help you guys. I'm uh, Dan Cornell. I'm uh, the founder and CTO at Denim Group. And I'm a software developer by background. And uh, also I'm the ch chapter leader for OWASP San Antonio and I serve on the Global Membership Committee. Passing the lavalier back and forth is weird. <clears throat> All right, so um, the way this talk kind of came about is uh, working at National Instruments. Uh, we have a whole lot of uh, tools, things that we buy, uh, things like that. And at one point, we kind of uh, came to the conclusion that we needed an IPS system, um, something to help kind of track uh, vulnerabilities and issues that were coming in, um, you know, whatnot. And the idea was we had a budget for it, uh, and management said, get us the best tool that we can possibly get for our money, right? So how many of you guys have been in this kind of situation? Everybody should be raising their hands, right? <clears throat> so what I did is I, I started looking at the different ways to look at this, right? And the first thing that came to mind was you can look at third-party reviews. Um, so I looked at SC Magazine. They had a great article back in February 2011, uh, and it actually ranked each, uh, well, each of about five or six uh, different vendors. Um, and it gave them stars, and stars are awesome, right? So if you have five <laughs> stars, you're obviously better than somebody with four stars, right? So based on this list of starring and whatnot, I'm automatically able to eliminate source fire and carnage night from, uh, from my um, you know, looking at these tools, right? <clears throat> the other thing that you can do is you can look at industry rankings. How many of you guys have ever looked at Gartner for buying a tool? Yeah. So I think pretty much all of us have been there. The magic quadrant is uh, something we all know and love. Uh, and so looking at this guy, we can clearly see then the leaders category over here, McAfee, SourceFire, and HP are my obvious choices, right? So we start looking at that. HP, Cisco, IBM, they're kind of out there you know, uh, on the verge. But McAfee and SourceFire are looking really, really good right now. Now the problem with these industry rankings, well, uh, is that it's Gartner. And we don't really know where those results come from. Cost. I can look at this on a cost approach, right? And that same SC Magazine article that was giving us all these stars and telling us this tool is five stars, this tool is four stars, um, that article also had cost for, uh, for these tools. So you start looking at that, and that CounterSnack tool that only had four stars, it was only 500 bucks per site. Wow, 500 bucks per site, that's awesome, right? Maybe I should get that, and maybe if I, if I only pay $500, I got $49,500, and they can use that for a raise, right? So we, we should all be so lucky. So if counter is not 500 bucks per site. So this is another way that we can look at uh, how we rank those tools. <coughs> the last one here is features. And I think features are the thing that a lot of us are, are uh, familiar with. So I can look at this, and I can say, well, it's an IPS system. So it should do O-Day threat protection, right? And it should do inline protection, and I should be able to do passive monitoring if I want to. I should have support for custom policies, um, real-time alerting, central management, uh, compliance-grade reporting, high availability, right? These are the types of features that we want. Now, here's the deal. Every single one of these things, there's a problem with it. And the problem you know, with the, the third-party stuff is you always have third-party bias, right? SC Magazine. They don't know things like I know things. They don't know my environment. They know what uh, people pay them to know, right? That's basically how it works. Um, with Gartner, you have incomplete industry rankings. There were actually some very, very major IPS vendors uh, that were left off of the Gartner rankings. <clears throat> In terms of cost, cost is always negotiable. If you're a very small shop, you're, not, you're probably going to pay more than a much, much larger shop that has that influence. Or if you go through certain purchasing uh, channels, certain bars um, that you use you know, time in, time out, you'll probably get a higher discount level. So cost is always negotiable. And then in terms of features, let's be honest. IPS systems at this point, features are basically a commodity, right? Every single one of those features that were on that slide, pretty much every single one of those IPS vendors has those. So we can't 
we can't buy our products really based on any of these, or there's a, at the very least an issue with every single one of those. Now the other issue here is tools are, are based on, they're normally evaluated based on features, not on enterprise value. So you start looking at these tools, and, and we have uh, you know, firewalls, and IPS, and NAC, and all these different things. We look at them in silos, right? We look at our tools and we say, I want to buy a firewall, and firewalls should have these features, and you buy that firewall. And then you move on, and you bought the firewall, and now you look at IPS and say, my IPS should have this feature set, and I want to buy it to do this. Now, uh, so this is a problem. Our tools need to work together. Our, our tools need to talk to each other. They need to be able to communicate. So when we're evaluating them, we can't look at them in silos because they, they, they don't actually work in silos. Um, the other issue is proprietary protocols. Um, a lot of these tools have uh, you know, protocols where they'll only work uh, if you buy that same vendor and things like that. Um, greedy platforms. So um, I, I like to think when, when I'm looking at log management, uh, how, how many of you guys have heard of uh, SIMS? Right, security information event management. These are tools that are designed to only consume data. They only consume data. They don't give anything back, right? <clears throat> and then uh, functionality. A lot of times we have these different silos, and functionality is actually duplicated across these different silos. So my firewall may have very similar functionality to my IPS system and vice versa. So we have to gauge enterprise value, right? We have to figure out how do we separate the bad tools from the good, the stuff that's actually going to benefit my enterprise from the stuff that's not. And the way that I've done this in you know, looking at this, uh, this problem here is I separate it out into different classifications of tools. And the first one is consumer. The idea behind a consumer is it's a tool that can get as much data as possible from as many sources as possible. So we have things like events, you event data. We have alerts coming from other systems. We have SNMP. We have syslog. Any tool that can take in all that data and do something with it, we call that a consumer. Now, as I mentioned, consumers can be greedy. So you know, just like the leech here, it can take in a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff, but it never gives anything back. Right? That's the definition of a parasite. So we need to be very, very care careful when we're looking at these tools that are consuming that they have the ability to give back. So now we get to providers, right? We want our tools to not only consume the data, we want it to also be able to give data back to the other systems. And when we say that, we say we talk about things like open APIs. Can I tap into this tool and use that API to grab data back? We talk about open databases. You know, maybe I have the username and password, I know the table schema, I can connect to the system and grab that data that way. Or maybe it's just a data export, right? You know, I can hit download to CSV and then use that to import it to another system. These are capabilities that we really, really like to have in our tools. So we have consumers and we have providers. Now, if we have both consumers and providers, we have symbiosis, right? And symbiosis means that you can take your tools, you can take the best of breed tools, the, the things that are going to most benefit you in your environment, and we can have those tools work together because they're able to provide data and they're able to consume data from each other. It also means that within your enterprise, even a smaller purchase can have a much larger impact. So take that counter snipe IPS that was only $500. In and of itself, if we evaluate that tool within the IPS silo, it's probably pretty worthless, right? But if we take that tool and we now add our already existing firewall functionality and our already existing malware functionality, and our antivirus and our um, vulnerability management, and we start feeding that data into that one IPS system, it now becomes infinitely more valuable for our enterprise, right? So if we can share that data amongst them, uh, it's much, much more valuable. Now, Symbiotic Security is not a piece of hardware or software that you can purchase. You can't buy Symbiotic Security. It has to be something that our vendors build into the tools, right? It has to be something that, you know, Maybe you use a middleman to get that functionality. But the, it has to, the tool has to be able to provide and has to be able to consume. It's not a ranking system for vendors, right? You, a vendor can't say, you know, um, we are the most symbiotic tool on the market, right? It, it's not possible to do that. And it's definitely not a label that you can slap on your product, right? There's no, now with new and improved symbiotic security. It doesn't work that way. What it is, is it's a philosophy. It's how do you evaluate your purchases? Right? 
When you go and you look for tools, when you are buying a new IPS system or anything else for that matter, you look at that tool and you say, well, does this tool have the ability to consume data? Can I take my already existing systems and feed that data into this to make it more valuable? And can this tool provide back to my already existing systems? It's a concept. It's how do you create an ecosystem of security systems? Not just one tool in a silo. How do we make our tools talk to each other? How do we break outside of those silos? It's a means of making the tools that we've already invested in more valuable to us. Right? You've already spent thousands of dollars on tools in your environment. And just because somebody says you should buy an IPS system doesn't mean you should buy the IPS system and forget about everything else. Make those tools work together. Now I'm going to warn you guys. There's something I like to call pseudo symbiosis. And the idea here is that a lot of these vendors out there, they like to say that they have different tools. And they like to say all these tools work together. So um, I'll, I'll just name it. McAfee, they were on that list. McAfee is a very large vendor. They have a very large tool set. It's very, very diverse. And most of those tools work together, right? Now, the problem is, is those tools don't work very well with other vendors. If you don't have McAfee products and you start looking at a McAfee IPS system, it might be far less useful than somebody who already has a McAfee, uh, McAfee um, EPO system or something like that, right? <clears throat> It gives uh, symbiotic, symbiotic functionality, but only within that vendor's tool set. Right? So you have to buy McAfee, buy McAfee, buy McAfee. McAfee wins in that, but you get stuck in the proprietary programs. Right? True symbiotic security is about being able to handpick your tool set. You should be able to get the best of breed tools, the stuff that's already in your environment, buy the best stuff that's out there, and have it all work together nicely. All right. So let's talk about tools and classifications. Now, right now, our data is sitting in these silos, right? You have reputation data, data about do I trust the source? By the way, if anybody wants a copy of this presentation, gladly give it out, and they're recording everything as well. So don't need to take notes or whatever. Um, we have attack data, information about how I'm being attacked. You have information about what attacks are my systems vulnerable to. You have information about what versions of OS and software you have on your systems. You have information about who's using your system. You have information about who should have access to what. You have information about uh, trust hierarchies. Um, you have information about authentication, authorization, what's been tested via QA. Um, trust boundaries is data crossing between two, two trust levels. You have all this data already. It's just existing within each silo of every single security tool that you have in your environment. Now, what happens if we break that day out and we say that these different systems can work together? We can answer some very important questions, questions that are, are detrimental to our security. Questions like, should I accept packets from some random IP address? How do we find the answer? We look at the reputation data. We look at the attack data. We look at the vulnerability data, the asset data, and the trust boundaries. If we have that information, and we're able to get that information from all of our different systems, work it together, we have the right answer to that question. Questions like, should I allow a random person X to download file Y? Take data classification, reputation, authentication, authorization, and trust boundaries. Now you have the answer to that question. Right? We break the data out of those silos. Even more magic. So with symbiotic security, the possibilities are limited only by the security ecosystem that you've put in place. So you can create WAF rules based on attack data, right? I get all this information about what's attacking me. I take that. I filter it back out. Say, here's all the attacks. Let's block those, right? You can get information about if a targeted uh, exploit is actually going to affect the system. Right? You, you look at, is the system vulnerable? Here's the attack. Mesh that data together. Now I know. Should I allow a system on my network? Right? All these questions. <clears throat> so I say demand some biosecurity. security. Right? This is my little pulpit up here. Demand some biosecurity. security. <clears throat> Let the vendors know up front that you're evaluating the tool based on the effectiveness of, uh, I'm sorry, that you'll be evaluating based the effectiveness of their tool based on these things. 
the other tools in your environment that you already have, the stuff you've already paid for that, can, that uh, the tool can consume data from, the other tools in your environment that it can provide data to, and the net increase in security for your entire tool ecosystem, not just their tool side. So having said that, um, I asked Dan to, to come and help me with this talk. And the reason why is I've been using a tool for a little bit at NI called ThreadFix. And I thought ThreadFix kind of embodied uh, what I'm talking about, what symbiotic security is, uh, in that it can basically pull from different sources, it can provide two different sources, and it's basically a mediator to allow these different things to communicate. So I'm going to hand this over to Dan to kind of show you what ThreadFix is about. Thank you. <laughs> Apparently in day four of conference, I'm starting to lose my voice a little bit. <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, good. Um, yeah, and so, uh, oops, okay. move this down. There we go. Good. Okay. Um, and so, uh, yeah, in, in, in talking with Josh about some of the things that we've done with ThreadFix, I think it fits real well with what he's talking about in this idea of uh, symbiotic uh, tools working together. Um, and so, what ThreadFix is, is it's a tool geared toward folks that are running software security programs. And it lets them consolidate the, all, all the a number of different activities that they're undertaking and to track those things and help folks you know, run vulnerabilities through the, you know, through the vulnerability management process, from the identification through you know, tracking them, transferring them to developers, you know, communicating them to security operations, and hopefully ultimately fixing the problems. Um, you know, one of the things that we observed and one of the big drivers for us to create ThreadFix is we found that a lot of people are finding vulnerabilities in the software security space. Like anybody, pen testers, you ever, who, which pen testers out there have problems finding vulnerabilities in web apps that they look at? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no one, at least no one willing to admit it. What we do find is a lot of organizations have challenges fixing the vulnerabilities that they identify. And so uh, you know, ThreadFix is geared in a vendor neutral way to help folks manage this process and run these vulnerabilities through to actual resolution. Uh, freely available, uh, you can download it off of Google Code. Um, we uh, ship it as a, a, a zip, like WebGoat, where you can uh, you know, unpack it and run it, um, or also as a, as a pre-configured Linux a VM appliance image. Um, but again, totally free, open source, and, and available. And <coughs> What we found when we were out working with different organizations is that you know, we found that a lot of, uh, most places have challenges in that it's a multi-vendor environment. You know, they're using different uh, dynamic analysis tools to find vulnerabilities. They're using different static analysis tools. They're using you know, manual uh, you know, threat modeling, uh, you know, penetration testing, code reviews, and stuff like that. And what we found was the existing vendor solutions, as Josh mentioned, are, 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 are kind of silo integrated, where everything from the vendor you know, kind of works together, but things didn't work together across vendors. And that presents challenges for organizations where they have multiple vendors that they're dealing with. And so um, what ThreadFix lets you do is, first of all, pull in the results from these different static and dynamic testing tools, as well as manual uh, you know, penetration testing, threat modeling, and stuff like that, and have them all in a single view. And so if you have, uh, you know, if you're running uh, and again, these examples are not meant to endorse anybody, but to, you know, if, you're, if your security group is running app scan, you're running around and doing scanning, but your IT audit group is using uh, your Qualys or something like that, what it does is it pulls this data in and normalizes it and gives you a single list of the vulnerabilities um, so that you can track those. And so it, you're not going to, you know, w w a, a bad interaction that we see in a lot of cases is uh, you run a scan, you get like a 400 page uh, PDF report with a color graph on the front page. Yeah. <laughs> and you go to the development team, and you're like, here you go, developers. <laughs> and the, you know, I, I put sticky notes on the stuff that uh, I think is particularly important. And the developer says, like, <laughs> you know, gives you the one finger salute of, uh, like, hey, buddy, get out of here. You know what? The, the only thing worse than that is going to the developers and being like, hey, I've got two PDF reports, right? <laughs> there's probably some data shared uh, in between these things, um, but I'm not sure what they are. Uh, good luck. And, and that gives the developers, like, every excuse in the world to push back and say, like, hey, you were like actively wasting my time, right? Like you, you've gone above and beyond your job requirements, and now you're actively wasting my time. <laughs> um, stop, <laughs> you know, you know, quit doing that. And, and so the result is like giant Excel spreadsheets get uh, you know, created um, and, and, and whatnot. So the first thing ThreadFix lets you do is, is in a vendor independent way uh, or pan vendor way to pull this stuff and normalize the data and, uh, you know, and look at it. Once you start dealing with this data as a, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a structured data format as opposed to in big PDF blobs, you can start to do some really cool stuff from a transform standpoint. 
Um, you know, for example, you can say, if I know I have a SQL injection vulnerability at this particular point on this application's attack surface, I can write a very specific IDS IPS signature that's going to look for potential attacks against this known vulnerable point. Um, you know, or I can feed that data into my web application firewall and get a better investment or, or better value out of the investment I've made in this web application firewall. Um, you know, because, you know, again, if you know that you've got a SQL injection vulnerability and you see a SQL injection attack signature, which, which may or may not be malicious, in the best case, you're going to send an error page back to that user because the database routine is going to throw an error anyway. In the worst case, this is an active attack. And so why not be very aggressive about protecting against uh, attacks on you know, points of your organization's attack search where you know you're vulnerable. You know, also, what you can do um, you know, is, or, or, or something we found to be a, very, a, a much more positive interaction, as opposed to interacting with developers by sending them uh, PDF files, take the vulnerability data, package it in a way that makes sense to the software developers, and send it to their software defect tracking system. It's, it's, it's crazy to talk to developers and say, hey, 90% of your job, you're managing your workload out of JIRA or uh, you know, Bugzilla or uh, you know, you know, ClearCase or you know, whatever, whatever your organization's tracking system is. But for this 10% of your job that is very security specific, you need to work off of PDFs or log into this like management console that's separate from the thing you're already using. Um, that, that sets up, again, these very negative interactions where you go to developers and you're like, hey, uh, like in addition to all the other stuff you're doing, here's a 400-page you know, PDF with sticky notes on it. And so another thing you can do in ThreadFix is package, like uh, slice and dice this vulnerability data and ship it over to these, uh, you know, ship it over to the developers so that they can access it in the systems that they're already using. Much more positive interaction than emailing PDFs, which is a very ignorable uh, means of communication. Um, and so, you know, and, and so again, in, in talking with Josh about his desire for symbiotic stuff, like that's a, a, one of the things that we're doing here. In that ThreadFix, uh, you know, we can talk uh, and, and consume data from most of the, uh, you know, the the popular commercial and open source uh, tools, both on the static analysis side and the dynamic analysis side. Um, and we can, you know, consume these different technologies. We normalize it to an internal data format, and then you can, uh, you know, can manipulate it. Um, one of the things from a philosophy standpoint is you know, we've tried to make the, uh, the use cases that everybody is going to use, um, you know, put those in the user interface, but we also expose a RESTful API and we've got a command line client for folks who want to script these types of interactions. And so that's cool because what it sets up is the ability to, uh, again, to slice and dice this data con to connect be between different tools. And we'll run through a couple of specific integration scenarios, but it, it, I, I think today it's less that we're trying to advocate these specific interactions, but more that we're trying to interact or to, to advocate the, the philosophy of, I've made an investment in these variety of different tools. Let's make these things work together in a way that's going to deal with our organization's specific use cases. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, we, we also, uh, you know, in mm -hmm. communicating out to these web application firewalls, IDS systems, we can pull data from the logs back in and map that back to the vulnerabilities that were, the, you know, the, the, the were caused for the creation of these virtual patches. And so all of a sudden, like the software security team starts to see things that are, uh, you know, starts to see this operational data that they might not have access to before. Um, and so like this lets you do prioritization, you know, because you're communicating between these different teams, you know, the software security analysts don't have to make decisions in a vacuum. They can start making decisions based on like actual attack information. And that's something that we see in a lot of software security groups. We see a big um, divide between folks who, you know, between the folks that are doing the software security stuff and the actual attack data that exists out there. And so, you know, all SQL injection vulnerabilities are not created equal. All cross-site scripting vulnerabilities are not created equal by having access to this operational data this starts to put the, uh, you know, the software security folks in a position to you know, better you know, risk rank and slice and dice this information. Um, so Josh talks about the, the, the kind of the philosophy of symbiosis. What, like kind of the next layer down is to look at these different silos or these different classes of tools and to start to look at like, what sorts of data does each one produce? What sort of data does each one consume? And so in this kind of limited example, what we'll look at is you know, we've got dynamic scanners that are producing web application vulnerabilities. We have static scanners that are producing you know, knowledge about web application uh, or software uh, application vulnerabilities. You know, you've got manual threat modeling and penetration testing activities that are producing knowledge of potential vulnerabilities in your software. You, know, you, can, you can pull all that data in to ThreadFix, and then you know, from ThreadFix, we can start to send out 
virtual patch rules for these uh, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, web application firewall systems. Like if I know where vulnerabilities are, I can tell these sensor devices about where the vulnerabilities are, and hopefully a good sensor device is going to be able to say, oh, you've got a vulnerability there? Cool. I'm going to be very aggressive in protecting against attacks that look like that class of vulnerability at this particular point on your attack surface. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, uh, you know, and, and, and also, from the IDS IPS systems, we can start to feed alert logs back so that we can see, like, hey, now we've got actual operational data uh, you know, that, that says, you know, of the 100 cross-site scripting vulnerabilities you found, these are the 10 that somebody really seems to be excited about, right? These are the signatures that are really getting, uh, you know, that are really being exercised. Um, and uh, you know, I had a great conversation with Ryan Barnett from uh, Mod Security, who I don't know if he's in here, um, but uh, you know, talking about like some of the stuff that they do in Mod Security can also be a source of vulnerability data. You know, they can passively watch the traffic going across this web application firewall and identify like, hey, here is vulnerability data as well. And so, so the IDS, IPS, or WAF system can also feed data about web application vulnerabilities out. And as I talked about, you know, ThreadFix knows a lot about vulnerabilities, but if you're treating this data in a, in, in a structured fashion, you can start to slice and dice it, package that up not as vulnerability data, but instead you can package it up as software defect data, send it to the software development teams and, you know, in a format that they can consume, and then learn about what the, uh, you know, what the software development folks, uh, you know, when, when they think that they've fixed vulnerabilities so that you can schedule uh, your rescans and things like that. And so again, like by understanding the, uh, you know, kind of the different silos or the different product classes that you have in your organization, if, if you can start to think about how could these things interact to make your investment in one, you know, create additional value uh, you know, from your investment in another. It, it was a funny conversation I had uh, in the, uh, leading up to the ThreadFix release, we did a lot of uh, briefings with press and analysts, and one of the analysts we talked to, are, they, are there any analysts in the crowd? Actually, don't tell me, I, I don't want to know. <laughs> so I'll just say what I'm going to say. But the analyst said, but, but PCI says you either need to have a vulnerability scanner or a web application firewall. Why would an organization have both? <laughs> <All right. laughs> It was a, that was a long day. <laughs> and I had to patiently explain, well, number one, PCI is not specifically about security. <laughs> you know, we're talking about the real world of organization actually trying to manage risk. Um, you know, and, but uh, but, but that, was, that was an interesting view from this analyst where you know, they, uh, you know, again, the question was like, why would you, if you only had to do one of these things, why would you do more than one? Like the reality is that you know, most organizations have more than one of these technologies deployed. And to really maximize the value of the investment that you've made, you need to be able to start to, you know, to, to promote these interactions. Because what you know about vulnerabilities of your organization, it's crazy not to use that to inform the scanning or the, 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 the sensing and, and, and blocking technologies that you have in your organization. It's crazy to say, like, I know, we're, you know, I know we've got all these problems. I hope that this thing that I haven't you know, told about the problems is, is actually being successful in, uh, you know, in, in detecting and blocking these. And so what we'll look at is one specific interaction. Again, I'm, it's less that I'm advocating this specific interaction. We, we gave this talk at B-Sides Las Vegas, and someone in the audience got like, very worked up um, about, uh, you know, about this interaction. Oh, that would never work, and I would never know, like, want to auto-block this stuff. And so it's less that I think we're advocating this specific interaction and more promoting the, uh, you know, the philosophy of we want to be able to have these types of interactions. And so what we're going to look at is using a dynamic scanner there are more than one dynamic scanner, pulling in vulnerability data and normalizing that and deduplicating it. So you've got one specific list of the vulnerabilities that you've identified through these different scanning activities. Using that to promote virtual patch rules out to your IDS, IPS, or WAF system, and then pulling alert logs back so that you can let the software security analyst know of all the virtual patches that you generated. Here are the ones that are actually being fired in production. <coughs> I had to, Josh's original slide said, uh, you know, vendors, this, this, this presentation exists because vendors suck. I take a softer stance. <laughs> I just want vendors to suck just a little bit less. <laughs> that, that's what we're asking. Is, uh, <laughs> um, like the reason that we created this is because when we go out and work with organizations that are deploying their software security programs, the, you know, kind of, uh, I won't name specific names in this case, but vendors tend to promote a, uh, a philosophy of like, oh, oh, you want uh, this, you want that, you want whatever, uh, much as Josh mentioned, like we have the total stack of, of all these things. 
you know, the reality is that you know in most organizations we don't see folks that have said like oh you know we've uh, you know like I uh, opened a vein and made a giant checkout to X Y Z giant uh, software company and they're responsible for like all of our enterprise security. What we see instead is organizations are dealing with multiple uh, you know m multiple vendors um, you know uh, like all these different uh, you know sources of data. And the vendor solutions uh, you know, typically do a good job of integrating in their silo. They don't do a great job of consuming the results that come from other, uh, you know, from, from, from other tools outside of their stack. And that's unfortunate because the reality in most organizations is that there is, is that you have to deal with um, you know, results from, from, from multiple tools. And so again, a lot of proprietary protocols, like of APIs, like of standards, and like our message is like, please guys, just like play nice. I know. Um, you know, in, in, especially in some in, in a discipline that is new uh, and, and kind of emerging as application or software security, it's obviously you know it, it evolving and everybody's trying to get their lock on the market. But like that approach, we, we feel is a very like customer hostile approach. Um, you know, to say like, oh well, the, you know, the way that we promote software security is that you use all of our stuff and only our stuff. Um, that's uh, that would be great if, if only a world existed where that uh, where, where you could enforce that on your customers. Uh, you know, as a big vendor, um, you know, the reality that we found is that you can't. And uh, you know, folks trying to adhere to this approach, uh, you know, vendors trying to adhere to this approach, again, we feel that that's like ultimately kind of a customer hostile approach because the reality is folks are going to buy different tools or they're going to do acquisitions and roll up teams that have different uh, you know, systems in place. And uh, you know, like it, it's better to deal with that reality and find a way to provide value to customers as opposed to try and uh, like you know, hold on to uh, you know, some sort of approach where, uh, you know, that doesn't uh, you know, it's not going to work. Uh, you know, it makes this all easier if you had like common data standards from uh, scanning tools, event logs, and so on. Um, and in the software security space, we're seeing some of this stuff. The MITRE guys have the software assurance findings and expression schema or safes. Um, which, which uh, basically they went to like the t top 20 vendors in the app or software security space and like ORed all of their data formats together. Uh, that's like a 300 page uh, UML diagram, um, which I applaud their, uh, again, it's not that like, a lot of work didn't go into this. It, the challenge is that like when my browser can't open the, <laughs> the, the standards <laughs> document, I, I, I question how useful that standard is. Um, I, I think they're they're uh, they're trying to like sort out some 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 funding things, and so we may see some stuff moving forward with that. Um, but but again, like the challenge that we had looking at it is it wasn't really useful, um, you know, for, for us in interacting with customers. There is also the OWASP data exchange format. Uh, Simon Bennett, the you know, the main Zap maintainer, um, you know, he's looking at this challenge as well. Um, and uh, I think he's working with Michael Coates now in, a, in Mozilla, and they just like beat him constantly and make him work. So I, I I don't know if he's had a chance to kind of push this down the field as much. Um, so one of the things that we did through our experience in putting together ThreadFix um, is we created the simple software vulnerability language, uh, or SSVL. <coughs> and this is based on our experience in interacting with these different tools and you know, importing data from AppScan, WebInspect, Arachni, you know, pulling data from you know, the you know, Veracode, White Hat, Qualys, all these folks. Um, you know, we've created or we've figured out like here are the fields that we think are absolutely important. These are the critical fields that we need to do these types of transforms that we found to be very, very useful to you know, virtual patching. Um, you know, you're communicating these things to defect tractors and whatnot. Here's the stuff that we think is absolutely essential um, you know, to be able to communicate. Um, and so it's very simple. It's very kind of stripped down. And for people with incredible eyesight, that's what it looks like. Uh, um, if you, again, this uh, presentation's online, or if you, if you want to uh, contact Josh or I, we'll get you a copy. If you're interested in, uh, in, in taking a look at this, it's a Google Doc, and uh, just email me uh, you know, what Google account you want. I'll make you an editor so that you can go in and, and make uh, you know, comments or contributions. But the advantage that I think we have versus other efforts is you know, we've done this from the bottom up, saying I've created importers that can consume data from all these tools. And here's the stuff that I actually import. You know, when I write an import, this is the stuff that I actually pay attention to. And so it's been battle tested based on our interaction with all of these, uh, you know, the static and dynamic uh, you know, scanner folks um, versus uh, you know other stuff, you know, the safes or something, which is from the top down. So let's look at what everybody's doing and make a giant, uh, you know, like a comprehensive look at what everybody's, um, you know, what everybody's doing. You know, we also think this is something that like this is valuable to vendors to be able to. Uh, to, 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 be, you know, to promote their interaction with different folks. Because that, like, at the end of the day, this is something that folks, you, your customers want to do. Um, and, and again, to deny them that ability is something that is a, is a customer hostile. Well, uh, do you have any, uh, anybody actually producing this SSVL reports and 
Uh, great question. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the question is, uh, do we actually have any vendors that are generating this SSVL? We don't right now. But we don't even produce SSVL. Um, that was uh, one of the goals. The 1.0 release was September 17th, and in the push to get things finished for the release, we don't have uh, yet have an exporter. Um, it's that's something that we'll have pretty soon, just because the. SSVL XML schema is a pretty direct reflection of the database schema that we have. Um, so I'm sure that there's like an open source Java you know, POJO thing that will just like crap uh, XML out <laughs> um, that looks like this stuff. Um, but it is something where we're, you know, we, you know, we have an opportunity to interact with a lot of vendors um, and we've seen the uh, kind of attitudes of a lot of vendors start to evolve and, and, and be more receptive, not necessarily specifically to SSVL, and again, like we don't, I, like I don't need to have my name on this. I just want, it, I just want something. We, you know, we'll donate it to whatever, or, or call it whatever, or whatever. Um, it, but the again, the advantage that we've got is it reflects like actual integration with all of these different tools that. Uh, yeah. um, so, um, yeah. Yeah. I was actually talking with uh, one of the vendors who does a, um, it's a host-based uh, malware uh, solution. And I was talking with him the other day and, and he was saying, you know, yeah, you know, this is great and whatever. And I was, I was telling him that we already have a uh, network-based malware solution. And, you know, he's like, oh, but, you know, my thing does this and whatever. And I started thinking about this, this whole thing. And I was like, well, even though both of these vendors are in the malware space, there's no reason why these two tools couldn't actually uh, work together. Um, if the host-based solution had information, or if the network-based one had information about an attack, they could provide that data to each other. The host-based one could say, hey, I noticed that somebody's hitting me, please stop it at the network level, right? And the network one could say, hey, I noticed that you have some malware, go remove it from that host. So even within the same space, I think vendors could provide this level of functionality and they could leverage it together. Um, so there's there's some very interesting stuff there too, uh, where vendors playing playing nice, doing these kind of open things. Uh, I think everybody can win from that. So you know this this is an I idea that I came up with when I was working through all this stuff, but I don't want this to be my idea. The reason why I spoke about this at B-Sides Las Vegas. The reason why I'm speaking about it here is because I want you guys to embrace this. I hope at the end of this presentation you guys all see value in this. And what I'd like to do is I'd like you all to take this, take it back to your companies. When you're talking with vendors, I want you to think in terms of symbiotic security, not just in terms of features or price or things like that, and use this in your day-to-day -day interactions. Um, some other ideas that we've had is, you know, what if we go to Gartner and we start talking about the Magic Quadrant and we say, what if we add symbiotic uh, characteristics to their evaluation criteria and say, hey, when you're writing this report on this company, can they consume data? And what data can they consume? Can they provide data? And what data can they provide? Right? Um, you know, what if we go and we create a wiki site where everybody can post a list of tools they're using and in what ways they're symbiotic? This should be a community effort. This should be something that we all work together to kind of figure these things out. And I think the more community effort it is, the more this, this grows and vendors are almost forced into being symbiotic, which benefits all of us. So with that, help us help the community. Um, SymbioticSecurity.com is out there. Um, we have those email addresses. Please feel free to email us. Uh, if you want to go and take the presentation back to work and tell your coworkers about Symbiotic Security, by all means, this, this is not meant to be a Dan and Josh thing. This is a, a community effort. It should be community driven. The, the nice thing here is that there's a lot of supply and demand, right? And so if you go to a vendor and say, look, I'm only going to select you as a vendor because you provide this functionality. Because I already own you know, a uh, tipping point IPS, and I have MACFI EPO, and I have you know, semantic antivirus or whatever. I have these systems. I want these systems to be able to talk with your tool. You have to provide me this functionality because that other vendor over there, they do provide me that functionality. And if every single one of these things that I have can talk to that tool but it can't talk to yours, they win, right? That's what you need to do. That's what you need to tell those vendors. That I think a lot of vendors, they're kind of closed-minded. They, they don't think that way. And that's why you kind of have to think in terms of who does provide this functionality and how do I encourage the ones that are thinking that way, right? And if they're not thinking that way, 
sit down with them, even if they lose the bid or whatever, sit down with them and say, you're not thinking this way, this is the reason why you lost. Um, to your second point in terms of OWASP doing this, I think OWASP is working in that general direction. Um, Dan talked a little bit about one of the, the standards that OWASP is working for. Um, you know, Dan and them, they've, uh, they're working on their, their language format and that will, I believe it will be open source, right? I mean, the, the whole thread fix is basically an open source tool um, designed, it, it's specifically in the application security space, um, which is kind of where OWASP kind of functions. Uh, but there's no reason why a thread fix like tool couldn't exist in the network protocol space or things like that. Um, I, I just know that you know their kind of core expertise is around the, the application security, and that's kind of why they've gone that way. Didi, oh, sorry. Uh, and, and one thing, uh, one thing I will say is it, it's been in interesting interacting with the different vendors as we've uh, you know done the kind of development and rollout of thread fix, and, uh, and 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 we've seen a lot of uh, you know. A kind of a range of responses. No one has been openly hostile to it, which is good. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, you know, but what we have seen is a range of responses from like, oh, you're doing that. That's whatever. That's fine. To folks that are you know have actually gone in and made changes. You know, especially in the open source space. You know, like the the Breakman folks. I don't know if they're here, but like they made like overnight changes to their file format. We said, hey, we need like these two or three pieces of data, and like the next day they're like, you know, the commit number or whatever has all that stuff in there. I'm like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we've also seen that from some of the commercial vendors where they've added um, you know, data fields to their API responses and said, oh, okay, you need this, uh, you know, this parameter in this way or whatever. Okay, good. Well, you know, like, you know, starting on this date, that data is going to start to be available. Um, really cool. And we've seen you know, vendors say, like, hey, we, you brought your stuff in and you're not catching these like 10 classes of vulnerabilities. You know, you've got good coverage over here, but you don't have this stuff. And so just in our interactions, um, you know, we've started to see some positive responses, which is really cool. And for those of you who actually, like, you know, I don't provide, well, I mean, we, to some of the vendors we do provide money just because, you know, we're licensees of the tools and whatnot, but like, those of you who are on the purchasing side of enterprises, if you guys start demanding this stuff, it, we'll see even more aggressive, uh, I think, adherence or, or, or enthusiasm for, you know, you're creating these types of interactions. And so, you know, we've done what we could, and again, like, thanks to all the vendors that have, uh, that have been supportive of the stuff that we're doing. Um, if you want, uh, like, uh, again, like, uh, once you start putting some real dollar, like, real purchase dollars behind it, I think we're going to see um, a lot more, uh, motivation to change the, the ways from the you know, from the vendors that are out there you, you touched on something that was really interesting too which was um, the, <coughs> the the uh, the fact that thread fix can basically consume from multiple vendors and you can actually use that as a comparison tool so you can say hey I'm going to try out the white hat and the barcode and the blah 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 you suck it all into thread fix and then you look at where the duplication is, where one is catching vulnerabilities over the other, right? So you can start to use this kind of technology just to see who's doing a better job at that stuff. So yeah. In one point, I'm gonna call, is it Shay, Chen? I, I don't think I've met you in person, but we've interacted via email a little bit. Uh, I don't know if anybody has looked at his comparison report uh, for different scanner things, uh, benchmarking. Definitely check it out. You know, you know, he can tell you about it or I'll send you a link to it. It's, you spend a tremendous amount of time, or what appears to be a tremendous amount of time, um, which is which is really cool stuff. But uh, again, like with a tool like ThreadFix, you know, if you're doing bake-offs inside of your organization, you can start. Yeah, you can start to say, we're going to run scans of the same application. We're going to flag all the false positives, and you know, then we can run a report where we see, you know, of X number of vulnerabilities that were found. This tool found some percentage, but their false positive rate was higher. Maybe we want to look at these other folks uh, instead because I would rather have. Uh, you know, again, what, what are your goals? Are you, do you want like deeper insight, and you're willing to deal with false positives, or do you need um, you know fewer false positives because you've got a whole lot of things you need to run through the scanner? Um, you know, using this, you know, once you've got data in a format where you can start to slice and dice it like that, it makes it much easier to ask those sorts of questions. So, I, I think we're out of time, but please, if you have questions, whatever, feel free to talk to us afterwards. Thank you.